The following program contains many scenes in black and white. Please do not adjust your set. You are about to look back at TV the way it used to be on New England's original television station. Boston, 1946. Radio was king. Television, well, that was something we'd heard of, but few of us had seen. Even in this age of miracles, it seemed pretty far away, but it was a lot closer than we thought. Over at WBZ Radio, they were making plans for a new broadcast center on Soldiers Field Road. Something new was in the air in New England. They already had television down in New York. They'd proved it worked way before the war. Now they were working on getting it up to us. Bouncing it up by airplane relay was one possibility, but the phone company had a better idea. Microwave radio relay across seven hilltops between New York and Boston. The question was, would it work? Could they actually send us pictures all the way from New York? These men believed they could. Bill Swartley, Bill Hauser, Gordon Swan, all from WBZ Radio. They were laying the cornerstone for New England's first television center when the microwave relay was ready. And they couldn't wait to give it a try. December 5th, 1947, the first test. In the old Hotel Bradford Studios, where a few lucky people saw Joe Lewis fight Jersey Joe Walcott from Madison Square Garden in living black and white. The microwave relay system worked one way, would it work the other? January 22nd, 1948, the second test. Together with our network, NBC, we telecast live from Commonwealth Pier in Boston back across the seven hilltops to New York. New York saw the fish pier in action. Though it was hard to distinguish the real snow falling on the pier from the snow on the airwaves. The microwave relay system worked both ways. And suddenly, a lot of people began to see the possibilities. Bill Swartley, WBZ-TV's first general manager, remembers. We wanted to be the first in New England. We had made a commitment to ourselves we were going to be, and we wanted to see it through. And you say, well, what would hold you up? Well, if you've ever tried to build a house, uh, was it completed on time? Plans to be on the air with regularly scheduled broadcast by March were thwarted by the worst winter in years. You couldn't build a 650-foot tower in snow and high winds. But then you couldn't wait too long if you wanted to be first. And being first was a busy tradition. New England's first radio station was determined to be first in TV. It seemed to take forever to get that tower up. Finally, there it was, the tallest man-made structure in New England. The dream was about to come true. WBZ-TV was going to be first. June 9, 1948. At 10 in the morning, WBZ-TV was on the air with what was to be the staple of our programming day, the test pattern. At one o'clock, more test pattern. At four o'clock, still more test pattern. At 6.30, the moment we'd been waiting for. WBZ-TV went on the air with New England's first regularly scheduled programming. A film of prominent New Englanders wishing us well. Arch McDonald, who did the news that first night, remembers. While we were preparing for the news, these saws were going and the hammers were pounding and all of a sudden uh, we, we realized it was time for news so i screamed and hollered for quiet quiet on the set yeah uh, real big stuff and so everybody stopped hammering everybody stopped uh, sawing and uh, we didn't have any furniture there wasn't any furniture in the building because uh, they were still constructing the place so we had a piece of plywood and I sat on a keg of nails, and that's how the, how the station got on the air. McDonald's sitting on a keg of nails, a little uncomfortable, but uh, we made it. It wasn't until several weeks later that WBZ Radio and TV moved out of the Hotel Bradford and into the new broadcast center. It was the finest facility of its kind just about anywhere. 
Ultra-modern was the word for the seven spacious studios. There were four cameras, a special projector for broadcasting films, the latest equipment for the finest quality pictures. And then there was our sleek mobile van, completely fitted out for remote telecast by microwave. And if you couldn't get out to the baseball game, well, just imagine, right in your own living room, the splendid splinter himself. Kurt Gowdy came up from New York in 51 to become the voice of baseball in Boston. We had only three cameras to start with. One in back of home plate, one in back of first, one in back of third. Three or four years later, uh, they wanted to put the center field camera in. I remember Joe Cronin had a big argument. He thought that center field camera picture was too good, that the fans would stay home instead of coming to Fenway Park. You could see the catcher signs. You could see everything from the center field camera. Finally, uh, Joe relented, and they put the center field camera in, and we had four television cameras to do the Red Sox game. The faces we first saw on WBZ TV may not have been familiar, but the voices were. We knew them from BZ Radio, Arch McDonald, Carl DeSue's host of Carl's Surprise Package, New England's first live children's show. Lindy Miller, comedian, newsman, host of Lindy's Lounge and countless other early TV shows. Arthur Amidon, singer, newsman, moderator of New England's first panel show starring the editors and later host of Boston Movie Time. TV was as new to them as it was to us, as Arthur Amidon and Lindy Miller remember. Uh, on camera, uh, was scary, that's what it was. <laughs> well, not only that, but uh, I remember I used to get butterflies in my stomach every time I'd hear that theme song, whether it was on the, that particular program, I mean, uh, you know. Then you'd start to clear your throat, and uh, I mean, quietly. And uh, the minute those lights would come on, you'd... that was it. Being live just drew out the best in the talent. It had to be good, and it just had to be good the first time. In the confusion of those early days of live TV, it was sometimes hard to keep your signals straight. Uh, one of our early weathermen, a uh, very scientific type, really knew the weather, but show business he wasn't quite sure about. And he, he was instructed in all the signals, the stretch signals and the time signals, and uh, he was on camera, and again, this was live, and he suddenly he's getting a very strange signal, and he, he can't figure it out. Little did he know that he was standing there with his zipper wide open, and he'd never <laughs> seen that signal before. <laughs> Eileen Neeland, another local radio personality, had heard there was a need for children's programs on television. Well she was told. among the first well, to respond right. to the challenge. I sat up all night doing a script, and I mailed it to TV4. 24 hours later, it was back again. Not visual enough. Well, that was when I called Ted Miller. He was a cartoonist, and uh, I decided that I'd call him the Crayon Man. Say, mister, I've got an idea. My dad told me once. If I knew something that was news, I should take it to the newspaper. Go right ahead, Sonny, but I don't think it'll do any good. Well, five minutes later, Sam was at the city desk, and the next day, he himself was calling the headlines. The show well, was the called The Lady of the Bookshelf. Bookshelf. Children loved it. So did the critics. But it was hard work. Not only did you have to find the stories and bring them alive with pictures, you also had to do the commercials live. Amazo instant dessert. Amazo the magic word. And your magic wand? Why, of course, it's Mother's Egg Beater. Just add Amazo to milk, beat for 30 seconds, and presto. You have a silken smooth, yummy pudding. One that's delightfully flavored. And boys and girls, there's extra fun in every package of Amazo now. A magic trick card, which you can do. In 1952, a great broadcast pioneer came back to New England, where he'd been the subject of the first simultaneous transmission of picture and sound way back in 1930, before there were any sets to receive him. But there were plenty of sets to receive him now. We knew him as Big Brother, the late Bob Emery, and he knew what all us small fry wanted. The one thing that children have always seemed to want of a personality in either radio or television is to be with him, to love him, somebody to love. Children are full of love. They just got too much of it. 
The late Bob Emery's contributions to television and to the kids of New England became legend. His work with the Jimmy Fund raised thousands and thousands of dollars. He also got thousands and thousands of kids to salute the flag and drink milk. It seemed to me that it's a natural way to get the children to drink milk on the air as an example to children at home. And how to do it? A toast to the president. So I had a picture of uh, each president in, as he came along, and uh, I drank a lot of milk. They drank a lot of milk, and I have all kinds of comments about whether I drank milk or not, but I did, so there. In 1956, still another pioneer in children's programming rode into town. He'd been a rodeo star and entertainer, and Gabby Hayes had told him he was great with kids. The question was, would a cowboy show be popular in New England? There were skeptics, as Rex Trailer remembered. Well, I was invited uh, to come to Boston to participate in a television show and, uh, at Channel 4, and I called some of my friends in the Boston area, and they said there had been other attempts to have Western shows in the area, and they just didn't go. So I said, well, I'd come up and give it a try, and everybody said, well, you'll be lucky if it lasts six months and a year at the most. However, as it turns out, we were on the air for 18 years on Channel 4. With his first sidekick, Pablo, played by veteran television actor Dick Kilbride, Rex Trailer invented the character later known as Cactus Pete. He was an old man who lived in a mine shaft, and he didn't exactly know his way around town. We had a little adventure that Pablo and I used to do, uh, where the, the old man would come out of the mine and then get lost all over the city of Boston and have great adventures. And, and the kids really got wrapped up in this because he was lost in the city of Boston for almost a year. And kids would call up the station and get very excited and write us letters that they spotted the old man on Boston Common, down on Tremont Street, on Washington Street, no matter where they found him. Any man with an old beard was the old man we were looking for. Boomtown's greatest innovation resulted from its need for more room than a studio could provide. So Boomtown moved outdoors, first to the old MDC trotting track on Soldiers Field Road, and then to a special set behind the studios. Looking at it, you'd think you were in Hollywood instead of Boston. It was a western town. It was a practical western town. It was right out behind the studio. It was like the movie lot of MGM or uh, 20th Century Fox looked like uh, an actual western town, had a general store, uh, the Boomtown Opera House, a hotel, Boomtown Hotel, balcony and all. Uh, we had a barn in which we stabled Gold Rush, my horse, and it worked out beautifully. By the mid-50s, WBZ-TV had become the entertainment center of New England. The showpiece was Swan Boat, New England's first hour-long live morning variety program. Swan Boat had something for everyone. The captain was host Nelson Bragg. The crew featured singers Lindy Doherty and Cindy Lord, home economist Polly Hughes, Dick Kilbride, and Miss Nancy, a baby girl who wasn't expected to do much except grow older, and Mike DiNapoli and his band. Just about every star who visited Boston visited Swan Boat. On June 9, 1955, WBZ-TV's seventh birthday, Swan Boat was broadcast live to New York, where films were made of these historic moments. Now it ain't no use to take abuse whenever they are cranky or cross. Let's put the women in their place and we'll show them who is boss. Open up the doghouse. Open up the doghouse. Ah, uh, Jack Chase, boy. Uh, good morning, Nelson. Good morning. This is the time we keep pace with Chase, the news of the day on Swan Boat. Nelson, you know this... Jack uh, Chase was also a regular on Swan Boat. Every morning, he'd saunter onto the set and casually ad-lib the news. Special masses are being held today over there in Worcester for the persons who were victims of that tragedy. There were, as you recall, 97 persons killed in the disaster and over 1,300 were hospitalized and, of course, about 12,000 were left homeless by that disaster. New England had already begun to count on WBZ-TV for innovations and news. There were many more to come. For the cornerstone laying Soldiers Field Road, I went out, did the thing, 
I looked at that big tower. There's a big tripod tower over the building. Went home that night and I said to my wife, boy, I hope I'm never in this building in a high wind. It started out as just another rainy day in the summer of 54. But the man who pioneered professional weather broadcasting in New England knew what was coming. That morning I said very, very definitely that this storm center looked to me like it was coming closer in over land than the government forecast indicated. The government forecast that morning, incidentally, was northeast gales along the New England coast. And a northeast gale doesn't bother us a bit, maybe a rough sea and that's all. To me, it looked like the storm, based on late reports I had got, indicated the storm center was going to come up over Providence and move to the west of Boston. And when a hurricane moves west of you, you get the danger sector, and that's where the damage. So I remember clearly that morning saying that by noon today, we're going to have hurricane conditions on a line east over and east of a line from Providence to Boston, meaning southeastern New England would have lots of destruction. Chase was doing the new news when Hurricane Carroll hit full force. We knew the hurricane was coming and that uh, it was heading for Boston. So I checked with Bill Hauser, our chief engineer, and said, what's our tower stress for? He says 100 miles an hour. I called Blue Hill Observatory and said, what kind of gust you got? He says 101. So I went to Wendy Davis, our producer. I said, you know, this is a risky situation. I said, can we stick a camera out the back door? and just have it on the tower because it was swaying. This giant steel mass was just swaying 12, 15 feet either way. He thought it was a good idea. And I had some film footage of uh, flood situations. I said, any time the tower sways, just go to that live and I'll see it on the monitor and I'll just describe what, what happened. That was the last anybody saw of our tower because I finished the newscast, which was 10 minutes long, went out to the hall to get a drink of water before filing my news, and the tower crashed in on the top of the building. Water came cascading down the stairways. The WBZ tower was in ruins, like much of the rest of New England. Using a temporary small tower, WBZ-TV was back on the air in time to report on the damage. We had to be. People were counting on us. They knew that uh, they could depend on a guy like Kent. They could depend on people like Chase and depend on uh, other newsmen that were in there. Somehow, those people continued to work. And the people knew, who were watching us and listening to us, that this was the case, and they were so... Uh, thoroughly indoctrinated and became so dependent and became so much a part of the family that when they were in trouble they just automatically turned toward the group and that group never let them down. BZ covered it all from Hurricanes Carol and Edna to the whirlwind career of a young senator on his way up. Under the guidance of Pioneer News Director Denny Whitmarsh, cameramen in five states, or stringers as they were called, risked life and limb to bring the story in first. BZ had a tremendous audience and it still does. Because they had stringers, so-called, all over New England. They had cameraman, reporter in Vermont, Maine, uh, up in the western part of the state, in Worcester, uh, in Rhode Island, in New Hampshire. Uh, Denny Whitmarsh, God bless him, developed probably the most effective stringer system in the history of television, I would say. January 1955, another first for WBZ-TV News. Inmates at Charlestown Prison try to escape, then hold their guards hostage for 84 hours. WBZ-TV covers it all live as New England and the nation watch and wait. And the only reporter to get the inside story is WBZ-TV's Jack Chase. Wanting to get better coverage of the Cherry Hill incident, I borrowed a fireman's uniform, hat and coat. I didn't bother with the pants because I didn't have time. And I did bluff my way past a couple of guards who were armed with submachine guns. Uh, but I carried it a little bit too far, apparently, because uh, at the third guard house, I was challenged by a guard who put a gun in my stomach and says, March, the warden wants to talk to you. So I went down and picked up the phone, and I figured the best defense in my case is a good offense so I said 
Warden, unless you get these people off my back, I'm going to pull a plug on these lights up here. He said, oh, wait a minute. He said, well, I have to admit I'm a little suspicious because uh, they tell me you've got gray flannel pants. I said, well, they called me out of bed. I said, this is an emergency detail. I said, what are you going to do about it? He said, oh, hold your horses. He said, I'll... he spoke to the guard and called him off. Ten minutes later, I'd gone back through the guards and I was on the network giving what I called the bird's eye view of Cherry Hill. And I was the only reporter during the whole insurrection that actually got on the wall overlooking Cherry Hill. Back in the 1950s, the hot topic in newsrooms and in classrooms all over America was science. And here at WBZ, we were looking ahead to the year 2000. 1957, WBZ TV was approaching its 10th birthday. It seemed the right time to leave something to posterity, a time capsule designed to be opened in 2000 AD. The man behind the capsule was Dr. Jonathan Karras. Well, we sort of got together a, a group of things which we thought represented, this remember is uh, June 23, 1957, almost 20 years ago, that represents sort of the humanity at the time. And uh, there are safety pins in there and some aspirin tablets, a man's nylon stocking, potato peeler, plastic measuring cup, can opener and a mouse trap, and the Holy Bible, and a whole bunch of letters from people like the president of General Motors and auspicious politicians, etc. And the somewhat marvelous thing is, is I put a letter in myself trying to predict what would happen when they opened this capsule and what life would be like. So we loaded up the capsule in the studio, went outside to the front, and uh, the reason for the ropes that you see is because there's a radioactive marker in it, because if in the intervening years the parking lot gets dug up or WBZ disappears in some kind of holocaust or something, you could, by means of some kind of a nuclear detector, find this capsule. And there's a radioactive marker there, which is why it's labeled, and it's in this little cement vault with a little glass over it. And if you go to BZ right now and you look out front, there's a marker and it says to be opened in the year 2000, so it's still there. I mean, I saw it just, you know, last week. At the time, John Karras was host of a show called 2000 A.D., a show that made a whole lot of television history. In the beginning, the idea of 2000 A.D. was to try and do some things that were unusual. There's a lot of talent around Boston, a lot of scientific capability. And I remember one of the earliest things we did in about April or so of 57 was we were the first television station in the world to transmit a television picture on a beam of light. Now, that was electronically very hard to do at that time, and in fact, you know, here is the picture of my much more youthful head. First image ever transmitted on a beam of light. But no studio was big enough for what Dr. Karras came up with next. And we started to do some fairly grandiose, one-of-a-kind things. Uh, walked through fire. We uh, had special suits and took a big porterhouse steak and cooked it live on fire with us in the suits. Then an event occurred that rocked the scientific world. Sputnik went up. And everyone's sort of running around trying to get a picture of whatever this thing is, you know, up in the air somewhere. No known ways to do that. And I got a call. We knew a lot of people in the Boston area, scientists, because we've been at this a long time. Got a telephone call from someone in the lab who said, how would you like to get a picture of Sputnik in orbit? I said, ha, that's a very funny joke, and how's everything? No, he said, no, seriously. And he said, well, down in Baltimore in a Knoll barn, we have a special camera which is used to track sodium vapor in the upper atmosphere. And sodium vapor lights up there, it gives a yellow radiation. So this camera is very sensitive to very dim light. He says, you know, Sputnik goes by, it reflects light. If we knew where to look, and we happen to be calibrating the camera at five o'clock in the morning by accident, gee, maybe we might get a picture. I said, beautiful. There was a, there's also a Westinghouse station in Baltimore. So we sent a photographer out, and now we have to find out where is Sputnik. So we go over to Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, where Fred Whipple was the head of it. He's now the emeritus head. And Jalen and Hynek, who I think all, everyone has heard of because he was the uh, technical advisor to Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Jalen and Hynek was at Smithsonian then. They had tracked Sputnik. So they called Baltimore, told them where to accidentally point the camera. So every morning for three or four mornings, this camera went out. There's a video output on this camera. And about the third or fourth day, they get this little dot of light going across. A motion picture of Sputnik 1 in orbit before anyone in the world had a still picture. Remember, 20 years ago now, October 57 we're talking about. So we got on the NBC News, we had this footage and NBC and everyone got mad because I guess BZ wouldn't let them have the film. We had it sort of first.
The Russians weren't the only ones to make great scientific achievements in 1957. That was the year that WBZ-TV ushered in a new era in television reception. This masterpiece of modern engineering out in Needham stood 1,349 feet, the tallest structure in New England. Technology and television moved into the modern era. Some of the great leaders of the time came to visit us. On election eve 1952, Ike had just finished broadcasting from the BZ studios when a clock fell on his head. A slight wound, but a great embarrassment to all concerned. In 59, we got a look at another leader as WBZ TV camera crews joined forces with NBC for a special broadcast from Soldiers Field Stadium. It was the first time that most of us had seen the guest of honor. WBZ TV was also turning its cameras on its own community to spotlight little known local problems. Innovative techniques were developed to dramatize these problems. Reporter Jim Jensen took Assignment Prison, a program aimed at the rising crime rate, as an opportunity to show us firsthand just what it was like to be arrested and imprisoned in the State Correctional Institution at Walpole. This was an era of powerful, dramatic documentaries. City in a Shadow dramatized the problem of urban decay so effectively that it won the coveted Sigma Delta Chi Award. This and other documentaries made WBZ-TV one of the most award-winning stations in the country. But that wasn't the point. The point was that WBZ-TV cared about the community, cared a great deal about the present and the future of New England. The 60s. That young senator from Brookline, who we had watched for so long, became president. It is a, a great pleasure to come back to a city where my accent is considered normal. <laughs> and uh, where they pronounce the words the way they are spelled. Videotape was in general use, communication satellites made it possible to telecast worldwide, and color was just around the corner. Suddenly, the news turned bad, very bad. We had grown up with him. We banded together as a family to share our grief. These were times of disillusionment and despair. We were at war again, New England boys were fighting 12,000 miles from home. It was the fall of 1965. WBZ-TV sent a news crew to Vietnam to follow two Massachusetts boys. One of them, Robert Jones, stationed on the USS Midway, made it home for Christmas. The other, Joseph Drew, stationed at Da Nang, did not. PFC Joseph Drew never made it home. He was killed at Da Nang a few days before this documentary went on the air. It was dedicated to his memory. Lamont Thompson, WBZ-TV general manager from 64 to 68, remembers. This was a tough era. We had the story of our men fighting Vietnam. We had the story of our young people here in Boston uh, fighting to, to get us out of the war. We were having student uh, riots uh, at Harvard uh, right next door over in Soldier's Field. We used to have massive uh, uh, peace demonstrations. We, uh, as a matter of fact, were invaded here in our station by a group of peace protesters. The uh, black community was uh, marching to, uh, to break out of the ghetto. Lamont Thompson and other media leaders met again and again with black leaders and came away convinced that minority issues could be most effectively covered by minority reporters. Well-known black newsman Terry Carter joined the staff. It was a beginning. Sarah Ann Shaw, Walt Sanders came in in the late uh, 1960s. As we launched into the 70s, television took a few great leaps of its own. Satellites were bringing us a whole new world of international events. Small portable video cameras, WBZ-TV's Instant Eye, revolutionized news gathering. It was the live remote broadcast rediscovered. The same microwave system used way back in 1948 
brought us some of the biggest stories of the 70s. Jack Williams joined the Eyewitness News team in 1975. Before this explosion of the video technology, anchors were limited what you could do between shows, simply because of time constraints. It took too long to get to the area, film it to come back, wait for the film to be processed, and then hand splice that entire story. Now things have been expedited. We can move out very quickly. We can get to the story via Sky I-4. We can shoot. They can videotape uh, the entire story. We can edit instantly and put it on the air, which has really uh, freed us to go much greater distances, to become involved with much more technical stories than we could before. In the spring of 1977, WBZ-TV introduced a totally new kind of program that rocked the television industry. Cy Yanoff, WBZ-TV general manager at the time, remembers. Well, Evening Magazine went on the year 1977. The interesting part about it at that time was that really the no one knew what a magazine show was. Someone said they were attempting to do something new, innovative, creative, local, and I knew it was going to be very, very difficult to do. But what it did do was give us exactly what we wanted, a local program that we could be very, very proud of, uh, that we could, in fact, uh, show the New England community that we were going to go places that, and, sh and tell stories that had never been told before to the people in New England. I'd say within Six months, I think, I believe the show is number one. It's still the number one show in the market. And I think from then, the, the name uh, magazine and television has really grown. Everybody now is doing a magazine. Magazine is where it's at right at this moment. So Evening was the first real uh, show to uh, at least give someone an opportunity to, to now know what a magazine actually was all about. Kids Fair. We are live at the Boston Common. We're here because of the International Year of the Child. In 1979, we started a tradition of our own. Kids Fair, an annual free celebration on Boston Common for thousands of kids of all ages. Last year, over 250,000 of our favorite people attended the festivities. And we expect even more for this year's Kids Fair on September 4th. Winding up the day, another BZ tradition, a free concert at Boston's Hat Shell with the Boston Pops Esplanade Orchestra. It's our special gift to the community we're so proud to serve. Amidst all the excitement of television in the 80s, something caught our eye, and we couldn't help but be concerned. Funding for the arts had been drastically reduced, so WBZ-TV made a major commitment to do something about it. So we got together an advisory board and launched the Fund for the Arts to raise money to fill the funding gap. We also created a slogan called, You Gotta Have Arts, and the money began to come in. So far, we've raised over $300,000. And today, on our birthday, we're pleased to present a total of $60,000 in grants to 16 very deserving artists. We've also helped to sponsor major artistic events. And we've made use of our own airtime to bring the arts home to your living room. You Gotta Have Arts did more than raise money. It raised our awareness of the value of the arts in our community with spots. Play it again, Dave. specials and its own monthly half-hour series, as well as live concerts on Boston Common featuring top performers. Keeping New England informed in the 80s calls for constant innovation. WBZ-TV is meeting that need with programs like the much-talked-about People Are Talking with Nancy Merrill and her often controversial guests, a show so successful it was expanded to an hour earlier this year. Continuing our award-winning documentary tradition, WBZ-TV has created a new special projects unit with three documentary teams tackling local issues in monthly hour specials, a massive local programming commitment. And last year, WBZ-TV became part of Satellite News Channel, providing expert news coverage of New England to this 24-hour national cable news service. 
For 35 years, we've been proud to bring you the greatest in sports. We were the first station to run the Boston Marathon uninterrupted from start to finish. We've been with the Celtics for the joyous years of victory and the dark days of defeat. And we can't wait for next year when the Celtics come back for revenge. Nowhere does hope spring eternal more than in New England. Just ask the Emmy Award winner of one of New England's hottest sports teams, Bob LaBelle. I'm not going to be so provincial as to say this is the greatest sports town on the planet, but try to find one better than it. It's got the greatest single event of all in the Boston Marathon. It's a total happening. The ultimate dynasty in professional sports has been the Boston Celtics. The ultimate frustration in baseball teams, the Boston Red Sox. And the Bruins have just got a history in this town that just can't be beat. The Patriots, they'll always be the Patriots. It's great. It's the passion. The fans just go at it with a passion. That's why it's so special. From sports to specials, from news to arts, people have looked to WBZ-TV first ever since 1948. For 35 years, New England has turned to us to share and to care to help in times of need, to entertain and inform. It's a tradition you can count on BZ to carry into the future, because like you, all of us will always treasure our past. For your hospitality, thank you and good night. Pleasant dreams. So long kids, see you next week. So remember that what the world will be like in the year 2000 A.D. depends upon the young people of today. So long, and make it a good day. And that's my forecast for now. So long, small fry. Well, that's the news for tonight. And be sure and stay tuned for the next 35 years. All right! Woo! It all began in 48. Channel 4 was first to bring TV to for stars and pars. You watched for tears and cheers for 35 years. We've kept you company every day. And when tomorrow comes, we'll say we're for today. We're for today. For friends who are here to stay. For a team that comes through share with you straight from the heart you've got someone